Sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-sri-
Nikama, by your sweet will, Tvai, concerning you, Na, our Aviveka, erroneous discrimination. Translation, since it has never been demonstrated that you are covered by material bodily designations, it must be concluded that for you there is neither a birth in a literal sense, nor any duality. Therefore, you never undergo bondage or liberation, and if you appear to, it is only because of your desire that we see you in that way or simply because of our lack of discrimination. Report here, our Kura states two reasons why the Lord appears to be covered by a material form or to take birth like a human being. First, when Lord Krishna executes his pastimes, his loving devotees think of him as their beloved child, friend, lover, and so on. In the ecstasy of this loving reciprocation, they do not think of Krishna as God. For example, because of her extraordinary love for him, Mother Yasoda worries that Krishna will be injured in the forest. That she feels this way is the desire of the Lord, which is here indicated by the word Nikama. The second reason that the Lord may appear material is, in, uh, is dicta dictated by the word Aviveka. Uh, simply because of ignorance, a lack of discrimination, one may misunderstand the position of the personality of Godhead. In the 11th canto of the Bhagavatam and Lord Krishna's discussion with Sri Uddhava, the Lord elaborately discusses his transcendental position beyond bondage and liberation. As stated in Vedic literature, Deha Devi Vibhago Yam Neshvare Vidyate Kvachit. There is never a distinction of body and soul in the Supreme Lord. In other words, Sri Krishna's body is eternal, spiritual, omniscient, and the reservoir of all pleasure. Translation, since it has never been demonstrated that you are covered by material bodily designations, it must be concluded that for you there is neither birth in a literal sense nor any duality. Therefore, you never undergo bondage or liberation. And if you appear to, it is only because of your desire that we see you in that way, and simply because of our lack of discrimination. So, the previous verse talked about how the Lord is distinct from the material creation, and uh, we can never attribute material activities, material qualities, or actions to the Supreme Lord. Uh, that, of course, is by definition of God, according to the scriptures. Uh, so here, Akura, of course, is following scripture, uh, or we can say confirming scripture, or he is actually um, pronouncing scripture also uh, by his very words. Uh, since Bhagavatam is part of the uh, scriptures, so all the words of the devotees who praise the Lord can be quoted as being scripture itself. Uh, so if we want to know about the Supreme Lord or who is the Lord or what is God, then we have to go to the scriptures uh, or go to uh, statements like this of authoritative devotees. Mm -hmm. So uh, on our own, we can't know what is the nature of the Supreme Lord? Simply because, one, we can't see him. Uh, secondly, uh, he's not subject to normal uh, laws that we see in this material world. So the logic that applies to the, in this world does not apply to the Supreme Lord. So if we uh, see the Krishna and... Uh, uh, Krishna does activity, uh, then uh, a Mahavadi will say, well, that cannot be Supreme Lord because there is no action in Brahman. So if there's action, it cannot be real. It's illusory. There's nothing in Brahman. If we see a form of Krishna, ah, that's also illusion. There is no form in Brahman. Uh, so for Mahavadis will say, okay, he's, uh, 
uh, illusory. The form of the Lord is illusory. Activities of the Lord are illusory. Yeah? Uh, this, of course, is also a reference to Scripture. They all refer to Scripture to say this. Other people, of course, uh, without any Scripture, if they see something, the Lord, if Krishna steals something, ah, he cannot be God because he's stealing. He's stealing butter. Huh? Uh, so either way, with knowledge or without knowledge, uh, people can come to wrong conclusions about nature of the Supreme Lord in this material world when he comes. He comes visible to us and still we make mistakes. But uh, usually the Lord is not visible. Only in rare opportunities when the Lord comes as avatar, then people can see him. Otherwise they cannot. Of course, it's also described that when materialists see the Lord, they actually don't see the Lord. So persons like Sisupal saw Krishna, and of course he was attracted to Krishna, but at the same time he really did not appreciate his real spiritual nature. He could not really see the form of the Lord because he was covered with hatred and ignorance. So he really didn't see the Lord. So Vishnu Chakravarti describes that the only time he saw the Lord was at the last moment when uh, by his hatred and absorption of the Lord, he became completely purified and the Sudras and Chakra was coming for him. Then he saw the Supreme Lord actually. <laughs> and because of seeing the Supreme Lord actually, then he could go to the spiritual world because he saw the Lord, the spiritual form of the Lord. So, uh, very difficult for a, a materialist, even if the Lord appears in the material world and they can see him, then still they come to wrong conclusions. But most people, uh, uh, the materialist, cannot even see the Lord, even if he comes. And uh, secondly, the Lord usually doesn't appear in the material world, so most people cannot see him at all. So all we can do is speculate about whether the Lord exists or does not exist. That's all we can do. Hmm? Through material logic, we can uh, come to the conclusion that, yes, there is something supreme. That's all. And usually that logic ends up with impersonal supreme. So that is why logic and impersonalism are often associated together. Uh, so, uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, some sort of uh, a vague conclusion can be reached. But we can never know about Bhagavan by logic, material logic. Uh, so, uh, senses and mind and intelligence cannot actually approach the Supreme Lord in his personal form. Yes, they can approach Brahman to a little degree, but uh, Bhagavan, form of the Lord, and his activities, they cannot understand at all. Huh? So, uh, in other words, it is very logically uh, difficult to conclude that God is blue. Why should he be blue? Maybe he, be, he could be pink or orange or purple or whatever. How, why would he be blue? So we can't conclude that by our logic. There's, there's no reason for it according to logic. Yeah? And, and why should he be a little boy? Why should he have a human form? Huh? Uh, so uh, why should he be a cowherd? So all these things are beyond logic. If we, uh, we, have, we only have to go to scripture and then just accept what's in scripture, yeah, we can do that. But otherwise, we can't conclude who is God, what his form is, or anything. Huh? So that is why we have to go to the scripture. It has to be our authority. And there we learn about God. And we also learn that he doesn't have one form, but many forms. Most religions have a struggle to accept any form of God. Uh, but, of course, we find that the Vedic literature is except form of God, but not one form, many forms of God. So, quite unique. Uh, and the forms are various, not just human forms. Then we have lion form, and horse form, and snake form, and turtle form, and fish form, and bird form, and whatever. All sorts of different forms we have, and all different colors. We have blue, and black, and white, and yellow, and red, whatever. Uh, all these different uh, colors as well. Mm. So uh, quite astonishing, but by logic we cannot 
prove anything. Huh? So we, we go by the scriptures and we accept what the scripture says. Huh? Uh, so uh, definitely uh, the form of Bhagavan and his activities and qualities are beyond uh, the material mind. Right? We, we can never conclude what it is. Huh? And even if we were to see it, if we don't have spiritual eyes, we will not appreciate its true nature. Huh? Uh, so, uh, as Sishupala did when he saw the Lord, oh, he's just some uh, pious human being. That's all. And he's got that position and power because he did a lot of pious activities. That's his conclusion. Huh? So, uh, we can never understand the Supreme Lord by uh, material logic. We have to go to the uh, scriptures for that. Huh? So, um, the uh, uh, statement here is that uh, we, we can never conclude that the Lord is, is covered by anything material. Here it uses the word upari, huh? uh, we, uh, which means a covering or an imposition, uh, such as a body a gross body or a subtle body. Hmm? So for the jiva, we can have upadis. Yeah, we have a gross body and we have a subtle body and these obstruct the nature of the atma so that we don't even know we're atma anymore. We get covered by ignorance. Huh? Huh? So that is the nature of upadi. It covers up the nature of, a, uh, of an object. Huh? Uh, but uh, Supreme Lord has never covered up Huh? We, we, by very definition, huh? so it says uh, uh, says that that uh, uh, he can never be concluded to have upadis like uh, uh, people in the material world. Completely opposite. Hmm? He doesn't have birth. Uh, he, he doesn't have distinction of dualities, which means body and soul, etc. Huh? None of these exist in the Supreme Lord. Huh? Uh, so in this way, we get a, a, uh, a definition of who is God. Hmm? This is distinct from a definition of devatas. Now many people in India will think that devatas are also supreme. Why? Because they have great power. Uh, and their abode is much more pure than our abode. So, okay, they are God. Uh, but if we go by this definition, uh, then they're not God. They are subject to birth and death. They have material bodies. Uh, they have material contamination. Uh, so we see that sometimes the devatas have fights among themselves and whatever. Uh, sometimes they fall from their positions. Uh, devatas and even Brahma have to give up their bodies. Hmm? Uh, uh, and they have a distinction between body and soul. So, uh, definitely not Supreme Lord. Huh? So this is one, uh, not only, but one uh, distinguishing feature of the Supreme Lord. Uh, no opadis at all, and therefore not subject to birth and death and all sorts of dualities of this material world. Uh, so, therefore, uh, no birth, uh, no bondage, and no liberation, because he's already liberated. <laughs> huh? Liberation means freedom from material upadis. So if he doesn't have material upadis, then what is the question of liberation? Huh? So he's always in his uh, position in the, uh, as a spiritual being with no covering. Huh? Uh, so, uh, if we think that the Lord is subject to uh, material contamination, etc., why is that? Huh? One is a viveka. We don't, we're not intelligent. Uh, we cannot distinguish properly. Uh, which is uh, true of anyone in the material world with material intelligence. Material uh, intelligence and logic uh, do not apply to the Supreme Lord. So we can never approach the Lord with anything material. So this uh, viveka or material intelligence is uh, limited. It cannot apply to the Supreme Lord. Hmm? Huh? 
And uh, the other uh, reason is that uh, the Lord does not want to show himself to everybody. He has his own desires and his own plans and whatever. So, as we know, Bhagavad Gita says, uh, the Lord is not revealed to the uh, demons and envious people and uh, others. Uh, uh, he's revealed to the devotees, but not to the demons. He does not reveal himself. He's hidden from them. Uh, so, he does it through several processes. One, of course, is simply because in ignorance they cannot see anything spiritual. Uh, uh, and another thing is that the Lord himself often performs activities that appear material. Uh, uh, of course, of Krishna, that's obvious. Uh, he, he acts like a cowherd boy. He doesn't act like God. does not show great powers, etc., uh, explicitly. Uh, uh, and get, shows fear and whatever uh, from Mother Yasoda, etc. So, very, very human-like in that way. Uh, but even the other forms, uh, if they manifest, uh, uh, they appear as if they are material because they have forms. And usually people say forms are material. So therefore, if the Lord has a form, he's material. Hmm? And uh, the, the, uh, the Brahman especially, no form, Abrupa. But he has a form, therefore must be material. Hmm? And he does actions. But uh, uh, Brahman is Nishkriya, no actions. Shouldn't have any actions. Uh, huh? uh, but the Lord has actions. And then when we see actions, then we say, ah, oh, he has karma. Because <laughs> action means karma. Huh? Uh, so the Lord, uh, by his nature, has somewhat of an appearance of uh, being material because he has a form, he has qualities, and he has activities, which we usually associate with the material world. And then in the case of Krishna, uh, more confusing because uh, he acts more like a human being than all the other forms. Uh, uh, he hides his powers in Vrindavan. He acts like a small child. He appears to be overcome by fear or ignorance, and he cries, uh, and he runs away from Mother Yasoda. Uh, uh, he steals things. Uh, uh, he uh, jokes with the cowherd boys. Uh, he gets defeated by the cowherd boys. Uh, so uh, this is puzzling for people who think God should be uh, some supreme person showing powers. Uh, so this is another way in which, uh, by his desire, the Lord hides himself. Uh, it's not easily understood by some people. Uh, so, though that is so, uh, that he may act in such ways, uh, one who is an actual devotee uh, will not be fooled by any of these appearances, and he will understand the Lord's true nature. Uh, uh, so that is the, also the purpose of scripture, to explain why Krishna is Supreme Lord, in spite of the fact that he's doing all these activities that make him look like he is a material being. So in other words, it reveals Krishna as Swayam Bhagavan. So that is one of the purposes of scripture. Yet, the peculiar nature of Krishna is that uh, the highest relationships are those in which you do not see Krishna as God at all. <laughs> uh, so Bhagavatam is establishing Krishna as Swayam Bhagavan. But again, it's also establishing him so that you can forget about that. Uh, completely. Uh, if you go to Vrindavan in the spiritual world, you do not see Krishna as God. Uh, so uh, his aspect as Supreme Lord is not so important as the uh, relationship with him. Uh, so, a Bhagavatam has two functions. One is to establish that Krishna is Supreme Lord and he's greater than any other being. Secondly, to hide his powers completely and to develop a relationship which uh, surpasses uh, any uh, respect for Krishna as Supreme Lord. Uh, uh, and how is that possible? Because uh, Krishna also has that very attractive nature in Vrindavan, which will make one forget uh, his nature as Supreme Lord. His pastimes will also do that. Uh, 
So, uh, in any case, uh, those who are devotees can understand the message of Bhagavatam. First, they can establish that, yes, a God is distinguished from living enti- other living entities, not contaminated, and that among other forms of God, Krishna is the highest. Hmm? Uh, so that is a very important conclusion to reach. Uh, so uh, some persons can come to the conclusion, yes, we do have Supreme Lord or Bhagavan. Rarer than that are the people that conclude that Krishna is the fo- highest form. That's rare. Yeah. And then uh, to establish a relationship where one forgets that Krishna is God, that's even rare. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But all of that is, uh, can be appreciated and understood by those who are devotees and they read with sincerity the Srimad Bhagavatam. Yeah. Yeah. So that is the message that comes out of Bhagavatam. Yeah. So Akura here is. Uh, uh, a devotee of Krishna and he can see Krishna directly but he appreciates his powerful aspect more than he appreciates the sweetness aspect Uh, so here we don't see him mention too much about the uh, people of Vrindavan or etc. Of course there is some mention later on but uh, it's not so prominent here at least at the beginning of his uh, prayers he He is emphasizing the nature of Krishna as Supreme Lord and talking and defining him very uh, philosophically, etc. So this, of course, has a function for himself to uh, increase his respect for Krishna. And uh, secondly, uh, to educate other people. Uh, uh, Other people will uh, hear this and they will understand uh, that Krishna, in spite of his looking like a, a normal human being, is actually Supreme Lord. Huh? Uh, so, uh, this is one aspect of Krishna. Of course, in Vrindavan, uh, Krishna has both aspects, though he does not appear and he hides his nature as Supreme Lord, he always is the Supreme Lord simultaneously. Uh, but the sweetness aspect predominates in Vrindavan. Hmm? Uh, uh, but we should not think, uh, because Krishna has sweetness, he's not showing all powers, whereas Rama shows more powers. Huh? Uh, but then that would make Krishna not so complete. Huh? So Racharyas say that that's untrue. Krishna displays most sweetness, but he also displays most powers, more than Ramchandra. Hmm? Uh, now, of course, it looks a little impossible in Vrindavan, but definitely in Mathura and Dwarka, yes. And we have statements like Akura, etc., that show Krishna is all powerful. And he kills many demons, etc. And not only he kills them, he even takes them to the spiritual world in cases, which does not happen with other forms of the Lord, like Nishimadeva or Ramchandra. Huh? When they kill demons, they do not even liberate them and put them in Brahman. They just get a body in the material world. Uh, But Krishna, he will liberate them or put them in Vaikuntha. Uh, So that is uh, shown. Uh, So, of course, in Dwarka and Mathura, he shows powers, great powers. But even in Vrindavan, he shows greater powers than any other form of the Lord. Though, not appreciated by the people of Vrindavan. <laughs> but he still shows those powers. So, so he's never bereft of his powers. Huh? So an example of that is uh, Krishna manifesting all the forms of the calves and cowherd boys. He becomes all the calves and cowherd boys for one year. How is that a manifestation of power? Because no one could detect it, even Balaram, who is another form of the Supreme Lord, got fooled. So he could fool Balaram. Who else can do that? Who can fool the Supreme Lord? That's how he showed power in doing that. Hmm? And then secondly, he revealed to Brahma uh, that he was all of the Vishnu forms that create all the material universes. Not one Vishnu form, but millions of Vishnu forms. And he was the source of all of them. Because Brahma saw them and they disappeared. Only Krishna was there. All merged into Krishna. 
Krishna can manifest the vision of form, he can make them disappear. So after that, Brahma was astonished. And he said, oh, this little cowherd boy, he is the source of all the Vishnus who create all the universes within which there is a Brahma. And he was one of those Brahmas among millions of Brahmas. Huh? So then uh, Brahma could appreciate the power that Krishna manifested. He is greater even than Mahavishnu and Garbhadaksha Vishnu, Shuradaksha Vishnu and all the other forms. Huh? Uh, so that is the manifestation of uh, great power within Vrindavana itself. Huh? Uh, so though it may look impossible, Krishna can do such things. Huh? So even in Vrindavan, uh, Krishna shows the most power and the most sweetness. Uh, so he is not in any way uh, uh, limited in his powers by manifesting sweetness in Vrindavan. Huh? Actually, the word Krishna itself is analyzed uh, as being Krishna. Na means source of bliss. Krishna means source of existence. Uh, so the bliss aspect is the sweetness aspect. And uh, the uh, source of existence, creation, etc. is the power aspect. Huh? So the word Krishna therefore means uh, the sweetest and the most powerful. He is both. Huh? And he can um, manifest these at various times to various persons in his pastimes. Huh? Uh, so uh, he is never uh, bereft of any uh, qualities at all. He is complete, complete manifestation of power and sweetness. Huh? Uh, so uh, he may cover these up to some degree for the devotees. He may cover up the powers so the sweetness becomes more prominent in uh, Vrindavan. He may cover up the sweetness to some degree uh, um, by manifesting uh, his nature as Supreme Lord to the Yadus in uh, Mathura and Dwarka. And uh, for the materialists, of course, automatically they're covered and they cannot appreciate. They're greatly fooled by Krishna more than other forms uh, and they cannot appreciate it all. Uh, so in various ways, uh, the Lord, by his desire, I will hide things sometimes and uh, people have difficulty understanding. Maharaj, on one side we see uh, our devotees like Mother Yashoda see him as an ordinary child, not as a god. Uh, when he goes to herd cows in the forest, carry shoes, carry umbrella, these kind of emotions are set. On the other side, when Krishna was shot uh, on behalf of Arjuna, he takes arrows in the battlefield and he bleeds uh, on even at the end of the past times and he perspires so there also he uh, non-devotees look like him uh, as a normal person so both look alike for us well uh, one uh, the, the, in the spiritual world uh, when the devotees in Vrindavan see Krishna as an ordinary person that is a source of establishing a closer relationship with Krishna in sweetness uh, uh, and we can say uh, it manifests out of their great attachment to Krishna. Mother Yasoda by her Vatsaya will refuse to see Krishna as a Supreme Lord even if he manifested as in when he manifested the universal form in his mouth. And she refused to accept it. Huh? Why? Because of the strength of her own love. It would not allow it to happen. It was a contradiction. So therefore she dismissed it and forgot about it. Huh? Uh, so uh, the source of, uh, uh, of of seeing him as a human is her uh, great attachment in prema. In the material world, the source is simply covering of ignorance. Huh? Uh, uh, they have no blissful relationship with the Lord at all. Opposite. Uh, uh, so they're they're seeing Krishna as an ordinary person uh, is caused by ignorance, no attachment, and the result is. No attachment. <laughs> Whereas uh, seeing Krishna in the spiritual world as a human being, uh, it rises from their attachment, it increases their attachment. It's caused by prema, it increases their prema. So, so covering is either love or illusion. That's what it is. Yeah. yeah. But again, well, we prema is not a covering, it's not a new body. Uh, it is intrinsic into the Siddha Jivas. 
But we also say in the uh, Akrura's prayers are glorified as the topmost in Srimad Bhagavatam. What makes it so special, Maharaj? What's that? Akrura's uh, prayer, in terms of prayers, Akrura's prayers are the topmost in the entire Bhagavatam, the entire devotee. His prayers, Akrura's prayers. Oh, well, of course, that's uh, one way of looking at it, but we can say that ultimately uh, there's so many other great prayers as, all, as, as well. Now, his, his offering of prayers is an example uh, of, uh, of uh, because it was prominent in his, uh, when he approached Vrindavan and offered his prayers and obeisances, uh, that is uh, his, his main item of fame or whatever like that. It does not necessarily mean it's the best prayer. Hmm? So we can, uh, there's so many examples of Brahma's prayers which are often quoted uh, after in the 14th chapter. Uh, very, very uh, well known. Uh, then of course we get the song of the gopis or something like that. Uh, so that's uh, of course a very, very exalted <laughs> prayer to Krishna, whatever like that. So uh, we can't say that his are the best prayers, but simply that he showed uh, prominently uh, this aspect of offering prayers in his uh, mode of approaching the Lord, whereas others will show things like kirtan or whatever, uh, smara them, etc. Yeah, this is prominent feature of bhakti, main feature of bhakti. Of course, well, well, that's assuming, but obviously he's a, a nitya siddha, so he's not a sadhana siddha, so one says he doesn't get perfection like that, like Lakshmi also. Huh? But there, it's their prominent feature of their uh, of their bhakti. Hmm? Well, one more thing, you know, you are explaining in the beginning of the class this regarding this, uh, you know, in the material world, people has a upadi, so with this upadi they cannot understand the supreme lord. If they if they try to understand also, at a, you know, they they can understand till the brahman, not above this. Mm -hmm. So now question is that you know even. To understand Brahman also is not so easy because living it has a material body, everything is material. Mm -hmm. but, but Brahman is a spiritual, you yeah. can say. But yeah. so how can uh, they will understand the spiritual with the material? Yeah. Well, if one comes to Sattva Gun, then one of the qualities of Sattva Gun is Prakash, which means knowledge or revelation. So that means they can understand they're not the body, they are the soul. So that's the nature of sattva gun within the material world. Uh, and the process of jnana, to get moksha and to realize we're atma and our body, is also sattvic. Uh, so sattva gun has the capacity to reveal atma that much. You cannot reveal Bhagavan, it can reveal atma. <laughs> uh, even though it's material sattva, it can reveal atma which is non material. Even if, you, if one is a sattvan also, but still he cannot understand the Brahman. Because yeah, he can appreciate. And therefore they study Vedanta Sutra. And then Vedanta Sutra confirms their idea that ah, I'm not the body, etc. I'm Atma, etc. Huh? And the question is, Maharaj, you see, in the Vrindavan, Krishna you know, display both aspects like sweetness as well as the greatness. But we see here, this Brajavasa really knows his greatness. Then knows only sweetness. Hmm? Brajavasis, hmm. uh, then re uh, they really knows his greatness. They all know his sweetness aspect. Hmm. Hmm. Not the, so, but uh, why he is hiding there? In the, in the Vrindavan, he is hiding, you know, his greatness. Well, uh, it will, it tends to, uh, if, if the Brajabhasis uh, uh, appreciate his greatness as Supreme Lord, that will restrict the sweetness. It restricts the sweetness, as in the case of the Yadus. They realize Krishna is the Supreme Lord, and therefore Vasudeva and Devaki's Patsalya is restricted and is not so intense as that in of Yasoda and Nanda in Vrindavan. Now, Krishna doesn't always hide his opulences, but uh, uh, it becomes a cause, whatever he shows becomes a cause of further increasing their love for Krishna which is very strange, how that can be. But we see that, for instance, when uh, Krishna lived for Govardhan, then uh, he's showing powers, obviously. But it didn't become a cause of uh, reverence, as in the case of Arjuna, seeing the universal form. Then automatically he was, oh, you're Supreme Lord, and I shouldn't have been sitting in the same 
chair as you and joking with you and eating with you, etc. Huh? So that was a cause of his developing more reverence and therefore his sakya decrease. Hmm? So when uh, the people of Vrindavan see Krishna's powers, as in the case of lifting Govardhan or where uh, Varuna began to worship Krishna and Nanda Mahara saw that, Ultimately, it did not increase their reverence. Rather, it increased their affection for Krishna. <laughs> they overcame it uh, due to the nature of their uh, love. Uh, and it simply served to increase their love for Krishna. And then, then they reject the thing as the, uh, he cannot be Supreme Lord. Uh? I was reading on commentary of Vishwanath. He said that, you know, if Rosavas is... Uh, understand that Krishna is the Supreme Lord. Still, they said that by understanding Krishna is Supreme Lord, their affection increase. Yeah, that's what I just said. Yeah, the affection is not that doesn't decrease. No, it increases. And that yes, oh yes, my son is a Supreme Lord. I'm so great. Uh, but uh, then, of course, they don't uh, they don't dwell on the fact that he is supreme, and therefore we have to respect him. Huh? Uh, so when the uh, Brajabhasis heard from Nanda Maharaj that Krishna was worshipped by Varuna and others, then they said, okay, Supreme Lord or whatever. Uh, but then after, then, then Krishna showed them spiritual world, etc. And then after that, uh, then they discussed more. And then they concluded, oh, well, uh, Krishna is the son of Nanda Maharaj. He cannot be God. And then they forgot about the whole thing. Uh, so it was a cause of developing more affection for Krishna. <laughs> Maharaj, uh, so we have uh, Shiva Tattva and Vishnu Tattva. So, and the difference between them is uh, in terms of number of qualities and its degree. Manifestation of qualities. Yes. So, actually one. Like Bhagavan is one, so Vish, uh, Shiva is also one with them. But oh. he manifests lesser amounts of qualities than Vishnu. Oh, so it means he also has 64 qualities. Well, you can say that, but he's less. Yeah, because Bhagavan is one, so Vishnu and Shiva are one, so uh, he's another form of Vishnu. Okay. Uh, and also, we also know that Shiva is eternal, but then he cannot give liberation. How do we understand that, Maharaj? Hmm? I mean, Shiva is also eternal, mm -hmm. and he, uh, I mean, he is like curd. I mean, we give this example, curd, milk and curd. Mm -hmm. Brahma Samhita gives that example. Uh, I mean, him being eternal and him being the next in the position of Vishnu, but still he cannot give liberation. How do we understand that, Maharaj? Well, in one sense he does. Of course, we say that only Vishnu can give liberation, but in Brihad Bhagavatam, there's Sanatana Goswami, actually he has mm, Shiva up there <laughs> in charge of the Brahman, and uh, he is the giver along with his uh, Parvati of giving liberation to Jivas. So. But ultimately it's coming from, the power is coming from higher up. Okay. But the very meaning of Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is to request the Lord to engage us in his devotional service. So can you say in that sense, uh, the, uh, for the Rupanugas, chanting Hare Krishna is the topmost prayer? For what? Uh, the fact that the chanting of Hare Krishna is a request to the Lord to engage the soul in his pure devotional service. Mm -hmm. Can you say that um, for the Rupanugas, chanting Hare Krishna is the topmost prayer? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There is no other yeah, prayer required well, for Rupa. It's not only prayer. Uh, that's one type of devotional service. It's kirtan. Uh, it is also smaranam. It's also uh, hearing, sravanam. It's everything. Maharaj, worshipping Vishnu and worshipping Narayana is same. Vaikuntapati Narayana is same. What's that? Worshipping Vishnu and worshipping Vaikuntapati Narayana is same. Narayana in Vaikunta. Vishnu. Well, Vishnu is just a general. It could be anywhere. So, so my, like if Maharaj said that there are millions of Vishnus and we see generally people worship Vishnu. So what is their destination, Maharaj? Where do they end up? Well, it depends uh, what their mode is. If they are actual Vaishnavas or they're worshippers of David is also, then they don't get the same result. If they're actual Vaishnavas, they go to Vaikuntha. To Narayana. Hmm. 